Hi and welcome back to another video. Also follow up video regarding non-K overclocking. In the first video, roughly a week ago, we were analyzing if it works out to non-K overclock a 12400 and also 12600 CPU. We were using the C690 Apex motherboard and also the C690 Hero motherboards, which are fairly pricey boards, depending on your location, probably somewhere between 600 and 800 euro or dollar. That is a lot. And then a lot of people were commenting that it doesn't make sense whatsoever because the main boards are so expensive. And you are right, if it was only the Apex and Hero which would support this feature. But I have very good news. The ROG Strix B660 G Gaming Wi-Fi does support non-K overclocking. We will show in today's video how this works out. Currently in Germany this costs about 210 euro. It's not the cheapest B660 board around, but I think it's a very good combination with a 12400F or 12400, which costs about 170 to 200 euro here right now. This, those two in combination should form a very good system, especially because this board also has a good amount of feature and also good VRMs, which is something you typically don't have on a, like 150 euro B660 motherboard. Then there is also the B660 F Strix gaming Wi-Fi, which is full ATX size, should fit in probably all of the cases, same like this one because this is micro ATX. That is a bit more expensive, it's about 250 euro, while this is about 210. But both are still in a price range where I think it is very attractive to build a non-K overclocking system with either of those two boards. The only negative aspect is still that both are using DDR5. As far as I know right now, there is no DDR4 board which can support it. That's a bit unfortunate, but as long as you somehow manage to find any DDR5 stick for a good price, then this should be still a very good thing. And also keep in mind that the DDR5 situation will get better from month to month. In like two or three months, it might be a lot better than it is right now. Sheik is also already waiting for our results, well, to see if the non-K overclocking will work on the B660G gaming Wi-Fi Strix board. I also mounted a box cooler, first of all, to check if it's working at all, because any cooler will work for that. And secondly, because last time we also noticed that the power consumption, even in the overclocked state during gaming, was typically between 50 and 60 watt. And a box cooler should be able to handle that. The process overclocking B660 non-K is a bit different than using the C690 version because you don't have to enter the tweaker's paradise. There is also no non-K unlock option, so it's a bit more difficult to figure out if your board will support it or not. Because if you just put in the CPU in the socket and you go to the tweaker's paradise, it will not show up and you might first think that it's not supported. But let's just go into the BIOS and I will show you how it works. First of all, make sure that you flashed it to the correct BIOS. Currently, we are using 1003, which is publicly available on the SUSE website. We will also host this in future on my website and also link the BIOS for download in the description of this video in case the BIOS gets lost for whatever reason. As I mentioned before, compared to C690, only a few things are different. First of all, that the Tweaker's Paradise does not show the B-Clock unlocking function. And also what I had to figure out for my system at least is that XMP will not work. No matter what I do, if I enable XMP and also if I lower the memory clock later, XMP will never work for me. But that could also be different for future BIOS versions. But just to get it working, we're starting with manual and we will also manually tune the memory later. We will aim for a 15% overclock. That's why we're entering 115 megahertz B clock. The memory modules I'm using are 5200 C38 Corsair Vengeance. That's why we're looking for a memory clock that is very close to spec. 5212, that's almost um, even to the spec. And we're setting the performance core ratio to sync all cores and the highest ratio available on the CPU, which is 40 for the 12400F and for the 12400. Now we also have to adjust the CPU cache frequency. We're starting with 36. And if we go back up, you will see the target CPU performance core speed. The CPU core speed across all the six cores will be 4.6 gigahertz. Memory frequency 5.2 cache frequency around 4.1. For the cache frequency, you can easily usually get 4.2 to 4.4, but just for a basic profile, this should be sufficient because you would typically try to eliminate any kind of factors that could make it a little bit more complicated for the first boot. Now we have to set some of the voltages. We're setting the core voltage to 1.3 volt. 
also adjusting the memory voltage to 1.25 that will depend on your individual memory kit for the CPU core voltage even though this is set to 1.3 we will now go to the DigiPlus VRM settings and set the load line calibration setting to level 4. And that is a very moderate load line calibration which will lead to a fairly high voltage drop under load. And we will have a voltage drop by about 50 millivolt, resulting in about 1.25 volt under load. CPU current capability set to 170%. Last thing to do is to set your memory. This will depend on the sticks you're using. Just check out on the website of your memory manufacturer. For me, it's 38, uh, 38, 38 and 84. And that's it. Now with F10, it will show that, please note that the system might require a reboot and stay black to enable B-clock tuner function. Please be patient and wait till the optimization completes. This can take up to a minute. If it takes longer than two or three minutes, something went wrong. But otherwise, just hit OK and you should be good to go. This is the typical boot behavior. It takes quite a bit longer than usual. Might take, as I said before, up to like a minute. If it takes much longer than that, like two or three minutes, then you should try to reboot and set again. Back in Windows, you will see the CPU clock fluctuate a bit because simply we kept all the C states and speed step and all those energy saving functions active. That's why it will clock down if not needed. But if you will run any kind of benchmarks or like any kind of games, it will always go to static 4.6 with this setting. You can see we used the B660G gaming Wi-Fi and the memory with this manual setting is also running pretty much what we would expect from the XMP setting otherwise. 5200C38 and also the Encore is slightly overclocked compared to stock. As you can see, we are running Battlefield 2042. Even though this is still a much hated game, I still like it for running um, tests and benchmarks. You might be able to hear it because I'm still using the Intel Box Cooler, which I think is personally quite impressive, considering that the CPU, you can see it on the bottom right, is still running 4.6 GHz across all of the six cores and is maintaining a temperature around 80 degrees Celsius, which is not impressively cool, but it's in a region where you can say it's playable and your CPU will survive. So if you want to run your first tests on the Intel box cooler, that is possible, but I would personally recommend maybe invest 20 or 25 euro more in a better cooling solution. Just to show how it's also working on the F version of the Strix B660, changed to the 12400 non-F and also switched to a Noctua air cooling unit. We are also flashing to the BIOS version 1003. Also here, very successful overclock, 5 GHz across all of the six cores using the B660F gaming. Again, hit very well the mark of the XMP profile with 5200C38. A bit more power also on the cache, almost 4.4. One more performance benchmark, even though we already completed this in the first video for the overclocked 12400, but I want to again show some temperature values and also power consumption values. Keep in mind that I'm using a rather high voltage just to give you a baseline what you should try to start with and then you can try to lower the voltage by like 20 or 25 millivolt in steps. Could be that the CPU is running like 50 millivolt more than it would require to run. You can see the package power draw is around 115 watt and again just to remind you that is the like the peak, the worst you can get. And in gaming, you should typically have something between 60 and 70 watt, which is a lot less. Score-wise, we are closing in on the 5800X, which you can see just below. And that is still very impressive. I also want to highlight that all the boards, CPUs and everything is hardware, which I bought in retail stores, which means that is something you can absolutely expect at home. No like golden CPUs, like pre-bin stuff or anything just retail stuff that is also very important and all the BIOS are also publicly available, nothing special, nothing hacked. What I also want to address is the entire debate with Intel will block this afterwards. It's very likely that they will maybe tell ASUS to take down this specific BIOS version or have like a new BIOS update version where this is not possible anymore. But in that case, we all have already downloaded this. We can make this public on third-party servers, so that would be no issue whatsoever. And then people are still thinking that Intel, for some reason, can secretly inject a new microcode in their CPU blocking this, but that's not what's happening. That's also not what happened with Skylake, because that is still a huge myth out there, because 
those BIOSes were taken down afterwards at a certain point. But if you had your Skylake overclock applied, it would still work. There is one option what could theoretically happen is if Intel would apply a BIOS update or microcode update over Windows update. In that case, especially if you're running Windows 10, because that is a perfect platform to run on Windows 10. You don't have eCores, you don't need Windows 11. In that case, just update to the latest Windows 10 version and just block the automatic Windows updates and you're safe. That's all I can say about that. And if you later decide that you have to update your BIOS for whatever reason, then it's your own fault, because typically that is also not recommended. For example, for my 24-7 rig, I'm still running the same BIOS version as when I built this thing like almost two years ago. Because if it's running, there is no reason to update your BIOS. That's all I want to say about that. Also, huge thanks to ASUS for making this possible for the entire PC industry. This is changing a lot of things for us, because we will be able to build hundreds and thousands of very good price performance systems that can probably beat all of the current AMD price performance rigs. I think that's, that's a huge game changer in the market. In the end, it's also positive for Intel, even though they would have never done that themselves. I'm not sure what they think about this, but they might not be happy, but I don't care. But thank you very much, Asus, for helping the entire PC enthusiast community. It's an awesome thing what you did, and I think we should not forget about that. Thank you very much. Have a good day. See you soon.